for a full decade earlier this century, there was a means of transport considered the fastest, the most technologically advanced, and the most luxurious of its day. We're greeting you now from the naval air base at Lake Hurst, New Jersey, from which point we're going to bring you a description of the landing of the mammoth airship Hindenburg. It's first under flight. Get it started. Get it started. It's right. In just 34 seconds, the golden age of airship travel was ended by the fireball that engulfed the Hindenburg, killing 35 passengers and crew. The airship's lifting gas, hydrogen, was quickly blamed for the disaster. Sixty years later, former NASA engineer Addison Bain has developed a startling new account of what happened. Using modern scientific tools to revisit the disaster, he's also confident he has hard evidence to prove his theory. I was 18 when I saw the Hindenburg. I remember it just like it's yesterday. And she's flying about a 300, 400 foot altitude. And traffic was stopped for a stoplight. And I had my convertible, I had my top down. And the stoplight went red three or four times. And nobody moved. They jumped out of their cars, just staring at this. You could see the passengers waving to the crewmen. You see a big thing like that, you think it's hardly believable it could be flying. But it's floating in the air just like a cloud. Majestic and beautiful. The Hindenburg was gorgeous. It was a beautiful ship, sleek and everything, and the people and everything in it was so just beautiful. Of course, it was Hitler's ship, and it was outstanding. The LZ-129 Hindenburg was the pride of Nazi Germany. Nearly 250 meters long, she was the largest aircraft ever built, just 25 meters shorter than the Titanic. The Hindenburg was the world's first intercontinental passenger airliner, the most sophisticated airship to have come out of the Zeppelin company's workshops. The Hindenburg was the epitome of German technology at that time. It was an airship really designed to carry passengers with a certain amount of luxury and comfort. It was the Concorde of the period, if you will. That is, why do people spend money you know, flying the Concorde? It's to get somewhere fast. That's what the Hindenburg was all about. It was the fastest means of sending passengers and mail uh, to the United States or to South America. The type of people who would fly uh, on the Hindenburg were probably very much the same type of people who would uh, take a ride on the Titanic. It was the wealthy of the world to do. The flight cost approximately, I think it was 1,400 Reismark which was the, about the price of, of a Volkswagen and a half. So that gives you a price comparison in today's terms, if you will. We were completely overwhelmed. We hadn't imagined that we would be boarding a flying hotel. We were aware that this was a unique experience. A magnificent experience, which might never come again. The Hindenburg could carry up to 72 passengers on her luxurious living decks. Flying at speeds of up to 135 kilometers per hour, she could complete the trip from Germany to America in two and a half days, half the time it took by boat. If you want to travel in a beautiful, elegant, and thoroughly pleasurable way, your first choice has to be a Zeppelin. When it comes to elegance, the most luxurious cruise liner is no match for the Zeppelin. By the 1930s, Britain and America's attempts to join the airship race had all ended in disaster, leaving the Zeppelin company in a class of its own. In one notorious incident in 1932, ground crew members had fallen to their deaths when the USS Akron broke free of her moorings. The Germans were far more advanced than the British or the Americans in the sense of airship technology. The British, unfortunately, had a somewhat of a haphazard uh, arrangement of simply copying captured German airships uh, during the First World War so that they really didn't have that uh, tradition um, and that, that fundamental technology that you needed uh, to build airships. 
The Nazis were not slow to recognize the propaganda value of such a prominent piece of German technology. Yet the man behind the Hindenburg, Hugo Eckner, was famous for his hostility to the Third Reich. Eckner was very open and blunt about his distaste for the Nazi party. In fact, it's probably a wonder that he survived the Second World War. A good example being it was anticipated by the Nazi party that the Hindenburg would be called the Adolf Hitler. Um, and Eckner did not like the idea very much and had, of course, then the lettering Hindenburg put on very quickly to uh, eliminate any, any temptation, if you will. But in Nazi Germany, Eckner's ability to stand up to Hitler was virtually nil. Hitler remorselessly exploited the Hindenburg's image, commandeering it for leafleting in his political campaigns. The Nazi party ordered that the swastika be put on the tails of the airships. And with that then, the, uh, how should we say, the party leaders used then the airship as a propaganda tool. And you have this airship flying overhead and Hitler standing there in, with his chest out, you know, this is Nazi Germany. The Nazis' confidence in the Hindenburg was more than justified. By the 1930s, the Zeppelin company had accumulated a huge reservoir of expertise in both the building and flying of airships. What distinguished the Hindenburg was the sophistication of her construction. Like all the Zeppelins, she was a rigid airship, built from an intricate, lightweight aluminium inner cage, which contained both the lifting gas hydrogen as well as the passenger and crew areas. Those living areas ran along the bottom of the ship, but the core of the airship was formed by the axial walkway. Surrounded by the ship's sealed gas cells, this ran through the center from one end to the other. Underneath those cells, along the hull of the ship, was the main walkway. This ran from the control car hanging beneath the ship at the front through to the passenger decks. These were found within the body of the airship at the bottom and contained the cabins, the dining room and the lounge with its big viewing windows where passengers would gather. Further back still came the freight and mechanical areas. Towering above these were the 16 enormous gas cells containing 7 million cubic feet of hydrogen. Hydrogen is highly flammable when mixed with air and Zeppelin always knew this was the airship's Achilles heel. Elaborate safety features were in place to minimize the risk of fire and to prevent any accidental leaks of hydrogen from the ship. The Germans felt perfectly safe with their hydrogen. It was definitely considered safe uh, by all the crew members um, because they had never had any reason to fear it. It was, a, it was an evil uh, uh, that was in Pandora's box that they knew how to control. In the smoking room, for example, the room was always under pressure to keep air going out of the room instead of hydrogen in any way, shape or form coming into the room. There were any number of safety precautions which they had taken. The airship's captain controlled the hydrogen through a sophisticated system of wires and pulleys attached to gas valves on the side of the cells. These allowed hydrogen to be released to control the ship's buoyancy. The vented gas would then automatically flow upwards through a sealed air shaft to a series of vents on the ship's upper cover. To minimize the risk of a hydrogen fire, the system was also designed so that any accidental leakage of hydrogen would also make its way up to the vent before safely dissipating in the atmosphere. Everyone was fully aware that if there were ever to be a fire on board, then that would more or less be the end of all of us. By 1937, the Hindenburg had already logged 10 successful round trips to her American port of destination, the naval air station of Lakehurst, New Jersey. As she set off on her first flight of the season, she was carrying mainly German and American passengers. That particular day, the 6th of May in 1937, it was raining, very bad rain, electrical storm. And uh, the ship was due in, and uh, the word got out that on the radio, we didn't have television, the radio stated that uh, it had to delay its flight into Lakehurst until it got cleared up. I was a part of the military ground crew. I mean, uh, and if it was delayed, I mean, we'd have to, have to stay here and wait till we got here. 
I mean, it was 12 hours late. When the word came through that everything was clear and that they were going to land the ship, my husband asked me if we would go to see it. I see the Hindenburg. I said, yes. So we grabbed my son, who was not quite four, and we went in. I selber hatte bei ihm gerade Motorendienst, also in der vorderen. I was keeping watch in the forward engine car on the side of the airship. When we flew in over the field to check the ground crew had everything ready for the landing. Aufgestellt ist und fuhr eben zur Landung an. How do you do, everyone? We're greeting you now from the Naval Air Base at Lake Hurston, New Jersey, from which point we're going to bring you a description of the landing of the mammoth airship Hindenburg. Well, here it comes, ladies and gentlemen, and what a great sight it is. A thrilling one. It's a marvelous sight. It's coming down out of the sky, pointed directly towards us and toward the mooring mass. It was fabulous. It was the most beautiful sight you would ever want to see. The people in it and everything was so happy coming in that, that particular day because I had seen it come in every time, but not as close as I was this day. It's practically standing still now. They've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship. It's been taken a hold up down on the field by a number of men. I could see the landing ropes being fastened on a winch below when suddenly there was a massive jolt through the ship and I thought, oh God, something's happened. My first thought was that the landing crew had pulled too hard and something had broken, but that wasn't it. When I looked out, I saw flames shooting forwards from the rear of the Hindenburg towards my engine car. It burst into flames. Get it started. Get it started. It's right. Fri and it's crashing. It's crashing. Terrible. Oh my! Get out of the way, please. It's running. Burning. Everything went so quickly. The way the ship seemed to rise in the air. I planned to hold on to the frame until the ship hit the ground and then jump. All I remember is feeling a shock in my hands. And then I fell. I remember my heavy engine car crashing to the ground, and then I passed out, perhaps for a few seconds. It's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen, the smoke and the flames now, and the frame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the fans are just speeding around. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry. I'm going to step inside where I cannot see it. Everybody, everybody kept running away from it and then afterwards running back towards to see what they could do, trying to help everybody out and pulling this and pulling that. That's about, and then the, the sirens were blowing and the ambulances. The fire went so fast through there that by the time it got to the nose, I mean, it came out of there like a blowtorch. The smell, the smell of the hydrogen, the blood, the, the rubber was terrible. And of course, there must have been human flesh in that because you could smell it. And it's like I always said, you'd never forget it. You would never forget the smell. It took less than a minute for the Hindenburg to be completely consumed by the fire. Altogether, the disaster claimed the lives of 35 of the 97 passengers and crew. One member of the ground crew was also killed. I thought my end had come, but suddenly there was the ground. Luckily it was sandy and soft, and I had more or less fallen on my feet. Immediately I picked myself up and ran away. As we got closer to the ship, there was a man still in there, and he walked out of the ship after the nose was on the ground, and. He didn't have a stitch of clothes on him. Everything was burned on him, from, and the only thing he had on him was his shoes. Everything, skin, hair, everything was burned. And he didn't, he died right there. It was like a fire of hell. Everybody, oh God, oh God, that's all they were can saying, because you couldn't help it. That's, and there was nothing you could do. 
All I could do was just look and cry. The accident has always been blamed on the lifting gas, hydrogen. But 60 years later, new scientific evidence has uncovered an entirely different explanation for what happened. A twisted, tangled mass of seared girders and bits of blackened fabric are all that remains of the proud luxury airliner Hindenburg that lies at the Lakehurst Naval Station. The death list is now 35, with 10, including Captain Proust, still on the critical list. In Manhattan, an extraordinary memorial service was held to honor the Hindenburg's German victims. Full Nazi honors were paid to the dead as they lay in state by the quayside, ready for their final journey back to the fatherland. Attention immediately turned to what could have gone wrong. There were numerous theories as to what caused the crash. Um, a turkey farmer taking a pot shot at the, there was, I mean, every conceivable uh, theory that you could imagine. The problem being proof, what really happened. Um, is simply very, very difficult to discern when the airship is lost, basically. At Lakehurst, investigators started to pour over the wreckage to look for clues to the disaster. One team was led by American officials, while Dr. Eckner, with senior colleagues from Zeppelin, supervised his own parallel inquiry into what had gone wrong. In the face of the intense media speculation about the causes of the crash, Dr. Eckner remained tight-lipped. As long as investigation is pending, it is impossible, impossible for me to give you any statement or any ideas regarding the causes of the disaster. The very first suspicion was that sabotage was responsible. By 1937, the world was waking up to the dangers presented by the Nazi regime. The motivation for blowing up such a powerful Nazi symbol was obvious. The Hindenburg was a vulnerable target for an act of sabotage. It would not have taken a very big explosive device to destroy that airship. Um, a firecracker would have, done, would have done the job. The FBI was called in to investigate and immediately began to look into the background of the passengers and crew. Everyone had been subjected to a thorough search at the point of boarding. Who could have been sufficiently determined to smuggle on board an explosive device? Attention quickly focused on a passenger called Joseph Spar. Spar was an odd character, a German acrobat. He lived in America, which put him under suspicion as a possible spy. He was also thought to be supple and strong enough to climb into the ship's structure to plant a device. Spa was also found to have been carrying a camera and flash that the investigators thought could easily have been rigged to start a blaze. But the theory didn't hold water. No hard evidence could be found against Spa, who survived the fire. The FBI reported back to the inquiry that the sabotage theory was a red herring. There could be only one other possible explanation for the accident, a mechanical failure. In the days before black box flight recorders, the investigators only had the evidence of eyewitnesses and experts to rely on. The Hindenburg had logged 55 safe flights. What could have failed so disastrously? The obvious weak point in the design was the use of the highly flammable lifting gas, hydrogen. The investigation quickly turned to how leaking hydrogen could have triggered the fire. The Hindenburg's arrival at Lakehurst that day had been delayed due to bad weather, and when it came into land, there were still storms in the area. As the ship flew in for its final approach just after seven o'clock, hydrogen was vented from the control car to bring the ship down. The Hindenburg then began its final tight turn, angling itself into the direction of the wind in front of the mast. The final maneuver was the release of the landing lines. It was just minutes later 
that the spectators and ground crew saw the first signs of fire at the top of the ship just in front of the fin. Based on the evidence of the 97 eyewitnesses who had appeared before the inquiry, the investigators were confident they knew where the fire had started. All they needed to do was explain how. In the absence of concrete physical proof, there were any number of explanations about the trigger for the fire, and it suited everyone to blame a freak event, an act of God. In the end, they came up with a theory that seemed entirely logical, one which put hydrogen at the center. They concluded that the gas must have leaked out and combined with air to form a lethal mix. All it needed was a spark from a buildup of static electricity to start the blaze. Hydrogen was the, the, the weak point in the concept, if you will. It was flammable, very flammable when mixed with air. Um, and it ignited, uh, simple as that. Today, the vast Hangar 1 at Lakehurst lies empty. Because of the official verdict blaming hydrogen, the great Zeppelin passenger airships never flew again, and hydrogen was permanently tarnished as an unsafe, explosive gas. After the Hindenburg, I would say there was a decline in all airships in Lake Curse. And uh, no matter how we fought, we just couldn't get them back in. The decline was very bad after the Hindenburg. Nobody would operate with hydrogen, that was the thing. And uh, Dr. Ector in Germany forbid any more passenger flights with hydrogen. Hydrogen was a no-no. As the doors on the hangar at Lakehurst roll back 60 years later, the Hindenburg dossier is once again being reopened. For the first time, this man is subjecting the unchallenged assumptions about the role of hydrogen to modern forensic techniques. Well, the prevailing theory for 60 years was first that free hydrogen got loose and mixed with the air, then there was a source of ignition, and that's the theory that's persisted. But I think that uh, it's much more than that, much more deeper than that. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour. The Kennedy Space Center in Florida is the center of NASA's launch operations. And it's here that retired engineer Addison Bain has spent his career working with hydrogen, used because of its flammability as a propellant in rockets like the Space Shuttle. It was Bain's experience of working with hydrogen for NASA that first sparked his interest in the Hindenburg story. I was on a one-year assignment in Washington, D.C. at the NASA headquarters, which is right across the street from the National Air and Space Museum. So I used to go over there and uh, visit quite often, particularly going over and having lunch. But there's a model of the Hindenburg in there, 25 foot long model used in the 1975 Universal Studios movie. There's a plaque on the wall and it says essentially the hydrogen exploded. Well, that bothered me a little bit. As someone who believes passionately in hydrogen's potential as a clean fuel of the future, Bain felt the gas might unfairly have taken the blame. He has spent nine years methodically re-examining the official account of what happened at Lakehurst that day. Every available eyewitness report has been read for clues as to what really occurred. The investigators at the time unequivocally just assumed that uh, since hydrogen was used as a buoyant gas, that somehow it got loose because it was flammable. As you read through the reports uh, and you look at how it was built up, there was no physical evidence building to the conclusion. Uh, there was no testing done to also support that, that evidence. So that made it, the story more suspicious. Bain's first step was to submit some of the official inquiry's assumptions to proper experimentation. In the workshop of hydrogen specialist Frank Lynch, he built a scale model of that part of the ship where the official report concluded the fire had started. The model allowed him to probe the hydrogen theory by observing precisely what would happen if a hydrogen cell had ripped by accident and developed a leak. What I've done, Frank, on the model is to uh, run a piece of tubing up and through and to the outside of cell four here to represent a leak in cell four, estimating probably a gash of maybe about uh, almost a meter wide. Yeah, 80, 80, 
80 to 1, that's a huge yeah. hole. Huh? Oh, yeah, you bet. And then I would, I would suspect then the hydrogen gas will come on up and go out the vent here or out the vent in the tail there. The hydrogen flow through the model simulates the kind of flow rate that would have been seen in a leak from the huge gas cells on the Hindenburg. A hydrogen detector is then used to see which way the gas flows. Let's try uh, the forward vent here. Ooh, it's coming out of there already. Okay, we got stuff coming out of there. <laughs> Let's try back here to vent back here, see if we got anything coming. Yeah, yeah. Most of it's coming. The model suggested that any leaking hydrogen would very quickly have flowed upwards towards the vents, exactly as the designers intended. And it was here that eyewitnesses had seen the beginning of the fire. The logic behind the hydrogen theory appeared impeccable. What the model shows is if you had a hydrogen leak in a gas cell, where is the hydrogen going to go? And basically out up through the uh, vent stack. And that's where we just suspect the logical fire to start, but it didn't. Bain had made a startling discovery. Reviewing the eyewitness statements, he realized the official report contained a glaring omission. The investigation had completely disregarded the testimony of two key people who had seen things happen earlier in the chain of events, because they were standing with a view of this, the other side of the ship. Most of the witnesses were on the port side, up near the nose or the bow of the airship. There, then there were witnesses on the port side, some distance away. There were very few witnesses who observed anything on the starboard side. In testimony, there are two people who discuss events occurring right along in here first, before the fire spread. The first burning out of the fire was on the starboard side, above and up. I saw a small flame immediately in the back of the top fin, in the back of the fin, in the back of the whole surface and the rudders. A roar and a burst of flame near the... The hydrogen theory only made sense if the fire had started at the top of the vent. Bain's discovery that it had started elsewhere was the first evidence that there was more to the accident than had been assumed. But to his expert eye, there was an even more glaring contradiction about the role hydrogen had played in the fire. Well, I've played around with hydrogen and created fires myself with hydrogen. Uh, some by accident and some from purpose, but uh, the, in the case of the Hindenburg, the, the action there simply just was not familiar with my experience with handling hydrogen. Something else was uh, taking place there. Though hydrogen is chemically unstable and highly flammable, hydrogen fires are very difficult to see with the naked eye, radiating a cold blue flame. And because it's lighter than air, hydrogen also tends to burn upwards very quickly. Yet the eyewitnesses were remarkably consistent when describing the colors of the fire. It was like a fire of hell. It was so intense and so red, very red, with the orange flames in it. I could see the whole airship from the nose to the tail, from where I was standing. And I saw that big red-orange glow and it came out through the cover. Those descriptions of the color of the fire were important clues, but Bain had only black and white pictures from the time to work with. So carefully sifting through the evidence, he built up a color image of the fire as it would actually have appeared. This is a uh, consensus accumulation of eyewitness accounts as they described it. And I sort of just built a spectrum of what they talked about and then we colorize this on the computer to show that. Typically yellow, orange, reddish type flame was observed. And of course, as we all know, hydrogen is basically invisible in daylight. Well, that's fine. I realized that at some point in time, hydrogen was part of the fire. There's no question about that, but it's being masked by this uh, intense uh, flame. The fire color showed the Hindenburg accident was a great deal more complex than the straight hydrogen fire the official report had assumed. The photograph was also significant in another key respect. It showed the airship was buoyant many seconds after the fire had first started. The airship is uh, still in trim. 
which means that a significant amount of hydrogen is still in these cells back here. If there had been a, a lot of uh, hydrogen loss back here in the stern area, it should have started descending immediately. The fact that the Hindenburg didn't immediately plummet to the ground as soon as the fire started was evidence of a further flaw in the official report's hydrogen theory. But it was when studying the filmed footage that he noticed another piece of evidence that the investigators had overlooked. The fire was so rapid and it actually engulfed the airship. And that's not characteristic of a straight hydrogen fire which would burn you know, upward. Now there was a slight wind that you could probably say that it would angle off to one side, but uh, nevertheless, just the whole action of the fire, it was almost like being in a forest fire where you gather fuel all around you. From her ashes will arise the knowledge. From her fate, the legend. Okay, sure, the airship was burning. Was it uh, being fueled by the hydrogen or was it being fueled by something else? The speed of the fire, together with its distinctive orange color, were clues that something else on board the Hindenburg was highly flammable, quite apart from the hydrogen. As well as the aluminium frame, the airship was built of wood, cotton fiber, and other materials that would burn easily and give the fire an orange appearance. But what particularly attracted Bain's attention was the incredible speed with which the outer cover of the ship had burned. He calculated the flame front along the outside had advanced as fast as 15 meters per second. The fire went so fast through there, it came out of there like a blowtorch. Within five seconds, the whole top was gone. It was so fast. It only took 34 seconds to burn. I mean, it just blew right out of there. The outer cover was a key feature of Zeppelin airship technology. Designed to give the ship an aerodynamic profile, it also had to be waterproof and reflective to prevent the hydrogen from expanding through overheating. Zeppelin's engineers achieved this by painting the cover with a doping compound containing a cocktail of chemicals and had developed a new formula specifically for the Hindenburg. Could those chemicals explain the speed of the fire? Searching through the archives, Bain found hints that changes had been made to the Hindenburg's doping compound, but he struggled to find hard information. Well, it was a mystery in itself. I had gone through five different archives, thousands of pages of information. I accumulated uh, libraries from other people, experts on airships, collectors, purchased many, many books on airships, and read through them, and frankly could not find specifically what was used to coat the Hindenburg. Bain felt sure the official hydrogen theory was fatally flawed. He suspected the speed and color with which the outer cover had burned was the key to the disaster, but he couldn't prove it. An amazing piece of luck was about to deliver the breakthrough he was looking for. The official explanation blaming the Hindenburg disaster on hydrogen looked fatally flawed. Addison Bain felt sure the truth lay in the airship's outer cover, but without hard data, he would never be able to prove it. The breakthrough came when I was attending a hydrogen conference in Cocoa Beach. And I saw this gentleman walking around with an airship book under his arm. And I walked over to him, I says, uh, may I see that airship book? And he introduced himself as Richard Van Truen. He says he was looking for Addison Bain to talk about hydrogen. I said, well, I'm here. <laughs> now, tell me about this. Richard Van Truen is an airship enthusiast with a huge range of contacts in the airship community. He was fascinated to learn about Bain's new theory. Well, up until the point of our meeting, Dr. Bain had not been able to find specific information about the Zeppelin's outer covering. Nothing has been published about it. So I was able to introduce him to a Mr. Hepburn Walker, a World War II airshipman, that had saved actual samples of the Hindenburg fabric from where she fell. Well, I try to get samples of any airship that's particularly rigid airships. I got samples of the girders for the Los Angeles, the ZMC-2 metal-clad airship. The Hindenburg, of course, is the most famous airship in history. And I figured, well, I'd want a few samples of the girder work and the fabric work. And I went out there and scuffed my foot and dug up 
pieces of fabric and so on. Remarkably, fragments of the outer cover had survived the blaze and were strewn across the landing site at Lakehurst. Oh, and I found that there were some fabric samples, that remnants of the Hindenburg. I was, a, uh, I was ecstatic. <laughs> I said, I know how to go find out what's in, the, in those materials, you know. The existence of genuine Hindenburg samples proved a key breakthrough. It meant for the first time Bain could study the chemical makeup of the outer cover and discover what might have made it burn so quickly. Examining the fabric first under an electron microscope, then using infrared spectroscopy, he was able to determine the precise mix of chemicals used in the doping compound. Okay, and this is the band we were looking for. That, that's the important yes. part right here. What was that showing there? He found that iron oxide and powdered aluminium were all part of the doping mixture. Being associated with space shuttle uh, activity, I knew that powdered aluminum was the fuel used on the, on the boosters. And I thought, boy, what a bad combination. The external boosters on the space shuttle are powered by a solid rocket propellant, driven by both aluminium powder and iron oxide. Yet the experiments confirmed that precisely these same ingredients were present in even greater quantities in the chemicals used to protect the Hindenburg's outer cover. The outer cover was similar chemically to solid rocket fuel. Was that flammable cocktail of chemicals the key to what really happened? To prove that, Bain would need to fit in a final piece of the jigsaw and explain how the fire had started. The US Air Force's research laboratories in Ohio are the United States' leading center for the study of the physical forces affecting aircraft, researching plane crashes like the TWA 800 accident. One key team here specializes in the dangers of sparks being formed by electrostatic charges in the atmosphere. Go ahead and bring the voltage up. As an aircraft flies through the atmosphere, it actually can build up a static charge on the surface of the aircraft from what we call P-static or precipitation static, and that's just flowing through the atmosphere. That kind of static buildup would apply as much to an airship as to any other aircraft. But of equal importance, the Hindenburg's landing at Lakehurst that day had been delayed due to bad weather, and the airship had rushed in to land between two large electrical storm fronts. There were thunderstorms in the vicinity, which meant that uh, the atmosphere probably was increasingly charged. This could be a factor in putting a substantial charge on the surface of the Hindenburg, more so than on a regular day. Yet this had all been anticipated by Zeppelin's engineers. The internal frame of the airship was designed to be electrically bonded, so that any charge it was carrying would have flow to Earth the moment the landing lines touched the ground, without any risk of a spark. You have to have electrically a good conductive path. So if you get charging on an aircraft, or if an aircraft gets struck by lightning, that the high currents or the high voltage buildup will have a good electrical low resistive path to flow on and off the aircraft. But while investigating the design of the outer cover, Addison Bain discovered that the Hindenburg would not have been properly bonded. The outer cover was made of individual panels of doped cloth attached to the main frame of the airship by light cords. These cords were poor electrical conductors, making it difficult for any charge carried on the panels from running off to earth. But that day, it had been raining. Some of the cords would be wet, making them more conductive than others, and thereby bonding them electrically to the rest of the airship. Any electricity on the bonded panels would safely have run off the ship when the landing lines were released. But some panels would have remained electrically isolated, retaining a huge voltage which would seek the easiest possible route to Earth. Eventually, the voltage difference between those panels and the earthed frame would be so great that an electric spark could leap across the gap between the two, allowing the electricity to discharge. Clearly visible under the electron microscope, the aluminium particles in the outer covering's doping compound 
would be a good conductor for that discharging electricity. Electrostatic charge has an affinity or an attraction to powdered aluminum. So once that reaction starts, then the aluminum gets extremely hot, of course, and it's in, in a very flammable environment, namely the, the cloth and the, the dope that's used on the cover. What's important there is the combination of those ingredients it can be almost explosive. That electrical current discharging through the cover would also generate heat, enough to set the highly flammable aluminium alight, the trigger for the ensuing blaze. Zeppelin would not have realized they were playing with fire. They had used the aluminium powder because it was an excellent reflector of the sun's heat, but little was known at the time of its flammable properties, and particularly how prone it is to ignition in the presence of electricity. With his theory complete, Bain is now ready to tell the true story of what happened to the Hindenburg. The Hindenburg's landing that day had been postponed because of bad weather. When she finally came into Lakehurst shortly after seven o'clock, it had just stopped raining and there were still thunderstorms in the area, meaning the atmosphere would have been more charged than usual. As the captain came in to make his final turn into the landing mast, hydrogen was vented from the ship's cells while the airship was gently slowed down. As the ship came into the mast and the landing lines were dropped, most of the electricity on the ship would have discharged to Earth. But crucially, some of the outer cover panels were insulated from the main frame, still carrying electricity. That proved the trigger for the fatal series of events leading to the disaster. I believe the sequence of events first started back here near cell one and two, where there was an electrostatic discharge occurring across the fabric to the frame. That essentially ignited the highly flammable outer covering material, which then burned quite rapidly. But that intense heat from that fire then expanded the gas back here in cell one to a point where it over uh, actually exploded back here and caused a forward jerk into the airship. The hydrogen then from that cell obviously came out and started burning above the airship. But in the meantime, very rapidly, this all this is occurring, the fire moved very rapidly forward up over cell four, which was observed on this side, and then rapidly would come across and then, then forward. It was only at that point that the film cameras began rolling. Newly colorized footage shows the true appearance of the fire. As the flame front advanced down the ship, bursting the gas cells below, hydrogen began to fuel the blaze, its blue color masked by the bright orange of the other materials that were burning. Bain is confident he has the true explanation for the Hindenburg disaster, but his theory is controversial, upsetting 60 years of received wisdom about the role of hydrogen. You can't tell me that the hydrogen wasn't burning in that thing because that oh, that, oh, that, well, once the uh, rear cells went, the uh, hydrogen started contributing to the fire. There's no uh, question I mean, about I that. I mean, but but the but the glow was in there before the fire, fire the fire broke through the fabric. I saw this big red glow in that cell. Yeah, from from your position, yeah. that's what you were seeing. I saw that red, big red glow sure in there. Did. But that's yeah. not hydrogen going, John. <laughs> well, something is burning. Sure, you bet it is. <laughs> but it wasn't the fabric, and I could see from where I was standing. The, whole top of it. I think that's that's what you saw was right. But what you didn't see was a few seconds ahead of there. I mean, I, was, I saw the... There would continue to be skepticism so long as Bain's account remained just a theory. To prove it finally, Bain will need to conduct one more vital experiment. He will need to sacrifice a valuable original piece of the Hindenburg's outer cover and subject it to the kind of extreme voltages seen that night. Ordinary fabric does not burn when a current is passed through it. Will the Hindenburg's doped cover catch fire in the way he predicts? This came from the top part of the airship. I know that because of the iron oxide coating. And you can see where it was burned around the edges. There's two rip marks here where obviously it uh, came off the, the cover and fell to the ground and probably self-extinguished with the water on the, on the wet ground that day. What I'm going to do is cut a small sample off of here and put it in an electrical machine and then we're going to turn it on and see if it ignites. Recall now, this sample is over 60 years old. The 
collectors' clubs around the world are going to kill me for doing this. Destroying an artifact. Combustion is virtually instantaneous. The Hindenburg disaster would have happened whether or not the ship was filled with hydrogen. As with the Titanic and Space Shuttle Challenger disasters, a vital but overlooked technological flaw had proved fatal. Although 60 years old, the sample still shows all the signs of high flammability. Work. But there was a final twist to come. Deep in the archives of the Zeppelin Museum in Germany, the Hindenburg had one final secret to relinquish. One of the crowning experiences in my investigation was the opportunity to go to Germany and visit the Zeppelin Museum and go through their archives. And frankly, by accident, I came across some very interesting information that's been there for a long time. Within the museum's archives lay the unpublished records relating to the German inquiry into the disaster. Scientists working for the Zeppelin company had secretly conducted their own experiments on the Hindenburg's outer cover. The conclusion they reached was remarkable. With the right conditions, the cover would again catch fire, whether or not the airship was filled with a flammable gas like hydrogen. Dr. Max Diekmann was a member of that scientific team. When my husband returned from Lakehurst, he went straight to his electrical labs to carry out tests on models. Firstly, with the cover of the earlier Graf Zeppelin airship, and then with the cover of the Hindenburg. Both were made wet as they would have been on the night, and then they were grounded. Nothing happened to the Graf Zeppelin, but the Hindenburg cover immediately caught fire. It's ironic that the tests that were done two months afterward are the same tests that I have run 60 years later. From what I can tell, that specific finding was never made public. And I've learned that that's probably for insurance reasons, uh, the politics at the time. Uh, obviously, the Third Reich didn't want to be embarrassed because of some bad engineering. I really think it was nothing but a cover-up. Zeppelin quietly made a number of design alterations to the Hindenburg successor, the LZ-130. Bronze was added to the doping compound to make it less flammable, and the electrical bonding was improved to reduce the risk of sparks. But those changes were all in vain. On the outbreak of war, the Nazis ordered the destruction of the remaining Zeppelins. With the advent of fast and reliable airplanes, the fate of the airship was sealed. The Zeppelin company never allowed the truth about the disaster to come out. The view of hydrogen as a dangerous and explosive gas became the accepted one, much to the anger of people like Addison Bain, who see hydrogen as the fuel of the future. Even when I was involved in writing safety manuals on hydrogen for NASA, invariably the, the, the topic of the Hindenburg came up, you know, and it, it's left a very bad stigma, you know, and in the, you know, the public perception is, is uh, that hydrogen is very dangerous because of that incident. But I think now that the real story has come out, uh, maybe it will mitigate uh, and dispel that myth. Once we realize that the Hindenburg fire was not a hydrogen fire, we can once again look at buoyant flight and its associated efficiency, its environmental friendliness, and the other traditional advantages that we've missed for these past 60 years, we can bring airships back to the mainstay and have them fill the role that they are good at. With the myths about the disaster now buried, perhaps the time has come when we will again be able to enjoy the unique experience 
of flying on these giants of the skies. There's a beautifully illustrated Channel 4 booklet that delves even deeper into all the historical mysteries featured in this series. For your copy, please send a cheque or postal order for £4.90, payable to Channel 4 Television, to Secrets of the Dead, PO Box 4000, Manchester M60 3LL.